Um, firstly, I'd like to apologise maybe for running out of time. I'm sure maybe many of the councillors would have liked to have spoke at this time. But uh, in the interest of trying to get some engagement from all of the people who have attended from the community, at this point I'd suggest that we actually open up the floor for the moment and uh, ask for anyone in the audience if they'd like to ask any questions of the speakers tonight at this time. And uh, also in parallel, I said earlier, we're going to send around the petition form as well, so if you could please sign that form uh, while the Q&A is going on at the same time. Thank you. Sorry, just a remind to please introduce yourself when, you, when you're asking a question. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Ollie Daniels. Um, I'm under the green route and beside the blue route, so I think I'm entitled to speak about um, both with a um, bit of clarity. <clears throat> I'm delighted to see all the politicians here tonight. None of you were at the Arab sessions. Um, and I was, I was heartened when I heard um, Mr. Kingarov talking about 1846. And it reminds me, in my view is, that you're a little bit like the absentee landlords. You're here tonight and it's about time. Because there's been a serious, sorry, let me finish please. There's been a serious lack serious lack of ownership for driving this forward. We talk about a vision for the city. A vision for the city has to start with the people. And I got a letter on a Friday night telling me to turn up on a Monday uh, to, to look at something that said that, we're going to, that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. I got planning permission for an extension of my house in August. I finished it in the first week in, in January, and two weeks later I got a letter telling me to turn up, and by the way, these polite people that you mentioned were going to knock over my home. It's not a house, it's a home. So while we are talking here about development, I've spent all my adult life traversing west, east, and east, west. And yes, it's not exactly fantastic, but you know what? We have a fantastic city populated by great people who have driven the growth of the city. The issue we have in this city, if we're going to grow it, is about bringing more jobs to the city. 83% of the investment by the IDA in the last two years has gone to Dublin and Cork. Nothing has come to Galway. There's empty buildings in the heart of the city that should be redeveloped as a high quality innovation hub. There's empty factories in Merview that could be redeveloped. There's plenty of people to work in them. And I, my question tonight is, please take on board the, the, the support that's here tonight from the communities of people that are going to have their houses destroyed and do something about it and show the leadership. But I'm glad that you're here tonight, but please turn it into action. Thank you. Question here in the third row. Um, Sorry, there's a mic coming down. Uh, good evening everybody, I'm Shane the Sheridan from the Green Party and I'd just like to make a few very quick points. The Green Party did not object to the outer bypass because of Bob Cotton or any SAC. We were the party who stood up 10 years ago and said that this city, for its economic development, for its social development, for job creation and to become a modern city, does not need a bypass. It is a monumental waste of money. Secondly, the we are not anti, um, I myself employ 60 people, I have five vans and one truck on the road. I need a proper transport system, but that transport system will not be served by a bypass. When we talk about people being evicted, whenever that date was, by the gentleman up there, I'd like to remind us that hundreds of people have been evicted every year in Galway because of lack of housing, and lack of housing for children and families. We are trying to develop a docks into a commercial development when we could have a sustainable extra town within our city centre accommodating 800 families and properly built accommodation. So there's so much we have to do to make Galway an attractive city for inward investment, to make a city that we can protect our tourism, have a city that can grow and more importantly create its own economic development. And if we think spending £750 million on a bypass we're absolutely crazy. There are small things we can do to make east and west. We could open up our bus lanes to cars with two people in them. We could extend the Quincy Tanya Bridge. There's so much we could do. But I will stand here and say that the TDs are wrong who are saying that we need a bypass. They are wrong. So that's it. Thank you. Gentlemen on the left there. Hi. Uh, my name is Peter Canal. I'm from Menlo. Um, I'd just like to... Um, 
reiterate some of the things that, that were said. That the fact is that um, this thing was called the Galway City Outer Bypass. You will notice that that name is now dropped. It's not called a bypass. Uh, Arab themselves have given me the figure of 5% of traffic is actual bypass traffic. So the reason for the road is to alleviate congestion in the city. Uh, actual uh, cross city traffic. Nothing to do with bypass. So you have to ask yourself why has every politician, who, just about every politician who stood up here, referred to the, the word bypass? It seems to be a, a fixation in their brains that this thing is a bypass. It is not a bypass. So, why have Galway County Council um, put this thing into their plan? Why do they insist on it um, progressing? What they need to do, uh, as has been said, is they need to rescind their brief to uh, the NRA and to Arab, and let's go back and plan the city properly and uh, come up with a better solution. Thank you. Catherine Conley wants to say a few words here in front. Just to address something here that Mr. Daniels has said, I was at both public consultation meetings. I was also the councillor that asked for Arab to commit to the city council. They're facts. Se secondly, 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 you, you might see horns on my head because for 16 years I've been demonised because I dare to suggest, along with the Green Party member when they were there, that there were sustainable s solutions to the traffic problem in Galway. I do not believe any outer bypass is a sustainable solution. And as Mr. Gallagher outlined for the school, that's extremely significant. But so are all the schools in our city. And if the traffic and that road is wrong for the Bushy Park School, it's equally wrong for every other school in the city. And I have watched for 16 years every single politician. It is not a night to play politics, and I'm first to welcome any change of mind, if there is a change of mind. For 16 years, I have watched the tunnel vision, and excuse the bad pun when we're speaking about outer bypasses, and tunnels under graveyards, and tunnels under the coral. I have watched the tunnel vision that has allowed this city to become gridlocked. There are park and ride objectives in the city plan since I was mayor in 2005. We fought tooth and nail to put in those park and ride objectives on the west and east of the city. And 10 years later, have they been implemented? No. We've heard a reference to school traffic. I disgracefully put a jeep on the road to bring my sons to school. Why? Because it is not safe to let them cycle from the Gladys to Bora Mall. How has that happened? How has that happened? How has it happened? It has happened because of the holy grail of an outer bypass being replaced with six possible routes on this occasion to the utter detriment of the development of sustainable solution to our city. And if the power in this room tonight and the energy could be used positively to come up with a, a solution and use the money, as Trevor O'Flaherty has said, to come up with a sustainable solution, let this be the first step in a journey to make this city that we can be proud of for a sustainable solution so that all our schools are safe and so that we can cycle to our work, walk to our work, but most of all take public transport. And I'm going to finish off very quickly with a number of facts. We endorsed light rail. Um, Brian Walsh has left the room. I put a motion many years ago endorsing public transport as an integral part of the solution to our problems and our preferred public transport mode was light rail. That was endorsed by all of the councillors in the city. Number two, Derek Nolan, we have already led a torturous process to take out the outer bypass, as that gentleman had said. It no longer forms part of our city development plan. At a great cost, it's been removed. So we can do one thing tonight, us councillors. We can agree to table a motion in all our names asking the executive to withdraw the brief from Marov. Certainly we can do that. But make no mistake, 
this outer bypass, whatever the route, is being driven because that is the political will of the politicians who have served the city. And unless that political will changes, then you're going to get an outer bypass and no other solution. So if there has been a change of mind, I welcome that tonight. But let us drive forth a sustainable solution. Uh, well done, Catherine. Uh, Derek Hamilton uh, and Hashka. And uh, just in case anybody would think that because of my accent I haven't been around too long, I've lived in Galway for the last 36 years. And uh, uh, as a member of Antashka, I've been involved in uh, various uh, elements of uh, transport planning down the years, from the very first stages when Buchanan came into Galway, up into the Galway County buildings and presented his land use and transportation study. Even at that time, we were reluctant to think that a bypass was going to solve Galway's transport problems, its traffic problems. It, 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 it won't. It never would. Um, I'm not going to read from these. I'm just going to quote a couple of lines, because time is uh, precious. But uh, from the government's own uh, just recently published planning policy statement, which was only released in January, it, it, it um, counted 10 principles, and I'm just going to read two of them, they're very short. Planning must support the transition to a low carbon future and adapt to a changing climate, securing less energy and travel intensive development patterns, which take full account of flood risk and facilitating as appropriate <coughs> the use of renewable resources, particularly the development of alternative indigenous energy resources. And this is the one that's more important to some people. Planning must ensure that development facilitates and encourages greater use of public transport as well as making walking and cycling more attractive for people in support of active and healthy lifestyles by focusing on development wherever possible at locations with more sustainable travel options. The other document I'm holding in my hand is a, a submission that's been made today by Professor Lewis Leslie on behalf of Trampower, who the people that came to Galway at their own expense and put forward and worked with a committee that was made up of local businessmen and residents, people from this side of the city and all sides of the city, and that put forward a light rail option. And he's made a submission there, and he's pointed out a number of uh, things where this whole uh, Arab thing is going wrong. Uh, and we've heard tonight all about bypasses and we've heard about roads, but we've heard very little until Trevor stood up and talked about sustainable transport. We had in Galway a few years ago a committee, which was a collaborative committee between the County Council and the City Council, which was a committee formed to talk about uh, alternative options. I forget the name of it from out of my head, but it was a committee that was around for a little while uh, it involved business people, it involved the Guardi, it involved the transport providers, CLE, Basir and all the rest of it. It only lasted about a year and it was dropped. Where, where are CLE? Where are Basir in all of this discussion? Where are the improvements to the public transport that we have? There's so much I could talk about, really. I didn't expect to be allowed to speak tonight. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Hello, good evening, uh, my fellow Galwegians, how are you doing? And uh, I'm very um, disturbed, just like the people whose homes are under um, the threat as well. My name is Joe Kelly, I have designed the uh, SUIG or SUIG uh, light rail system, and I have designed it with uh, in the intention of, in mind to solve the congestion problem, but not only solve congestion, but also try and decrease unemployment. Uh, the system uh, itself, if I could just uh, unravel this map here. Thank you very much, James. It's upside down. <laughs> that, that's the Australian version, that is. <laughs> so if you can hold it up high, please, thank you very much. So if we see, um, like our gentleman in NYG said earlier on, that we need spines to come into the city to, to obviously alleviate 
the traffic both from the county and from within the city as well. So looking at the CSO figures through the SAPS map and going through every DED that of those people who commute into the city, we have four main commuter nodes going by the National Spatial Strategy of the catchment areas. So we have Clare Galway, which follows in from Tune. We have Ora Moore. We have uh, Barna and not Nakara. And we have the traffic from my colour and the art. So a park and ride at those four points. And then we have a light rail system that we're following uh, there, which will serve all in land uses from industrial, residential, commercial, uh, recreational and uh, educational. <coughs> and also within an integrated light rail system, an integrated transport system, we have feeding bus lines that would go from Friars Hill to NUI in Quincentennial. There is enough space on the Quincentennial Bridge for this. So what I just can on for a second and just think. What, what I'd say is we have to identify what is causing the congestion. <coughs> the high level of care dependency in this country, and Galway is a, a particular example of that. So if we remove or provide an incentive to remove um, the singular commuting care traffic from Galway's routes, the routes will flow more freely for the commercial traffic or inter-regional traffic that will travel um, through and around the city and across the city. So the incentive being, if we were to offer an adult uh, five euro full access ticket per day um, and working off the numbers that we've, we've, we've got from the four commuter nodes, which comes to 41,000 uh, that go into the city's infrastructure each day by the CSO SAPS maps figures through each of the DEDs in the catchment areas. And from within the city, from the park and rides inward, we counted 34,000 people who would use, uh, who use cars, basically, from, from within the cities, uh, the inner city and, and beyond. So they're actually following the usual behavior trend of living in the west and traveling to the east to work. Joe, Joe, can I ask you? Maybe just to summarise quickly, just yeah, allow sure. to speakers, please. Oh, well, of course. So basically, to summarise quickly, um, th this light rail system also adheres to the Transport Act 2001, Section 39, Subsection 2, Part B, which has to respect humans, flora, fauna and architectural conservation. So, just to, just to summarise briefly, this system makes total sense makes total sense in both, in both economical, environmental, and it's going to improve Galway socially so much so to boost tourism and create jobs. So why not? If it's, it will cost 600 million and it's cheaper than this blueprint uh, amalgamation route of 750 million. It makes perfect sense. Thank it's you, Joe. It's going to be Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Paddy O'Malley, say a few words. I know there's another hand down below. You're next. Thanks, Mike. Um, my name is Paddy O'Malley and I live in Bushy Park. And I'd like to direct this question at Senator Healy Eames, who's the only person who seemed to clarify this for me tonight in relation to this whole process, that the Galway City Council are those who requested the report from Arab. Am I correct in saying that? The Galway County Council. Well, there's two things in relation to the process. First of all, it's bordering on near fascism, the way it's been dealt with. It's certainly arrogant, the way people were approached and these routes uh, put up in public and the implications that they have on people. I think there's ample uh, feeling and thoughts here in the room in relation to why it's completely flawed and should not go ahead. I think looking at the time frame here, it is important that it's publicly requested here tonight that the announcement of a proposed route does not go ahead in April. And the reason being is that people who are affected by a such proposed route and it's my opinion that it'll never see the light of day. But there is a situation here where a proposed route impacts on all we've said in relation to community, education, etc. But the people are being isolated on that particular route and it's divisive in what has been done to communities in relation to one route against the other. So I'd like to publicly ask our representatives to stop the process in relation to a proposed route going ahead in April.
My name is Brendan Smith. Um, Deputy Noel Grealish made reference to the incinerator campaign of a number of years ago. I was one of the organizers of that campaign. We were initially dismissed as a bunch of NIMBYs, not in my backyard attitude, that the modern society needed a waste system and that was incineration. The whole, a lot of the system was against us, the consultants was against us, the money was against us, but we fought it. We united communities all across the city. 22 and a half thousand people came together and said no to waste in true incineration, but yes to recycling. As a result, Galway City became the first local authority in the whole country to put in a re tree recycling bin system. We were better than everybody else because we stood together as a community. There was a fear at the time that it was only Castle Gar because of the incineration. It's the same tonight. These roads are playing one community off against the other. My house, unlike Ollie, is not going to be knocked down. But if the orange route goes through, I'm going to be living in a zoo because there'll be four roads all around me where I live in Sandy Fed Lawn. A few years ago, they told us that they needed a four lane going through the Dyke Road with um, um, lights on the Prince Centennial Bridge and they said there was no alternative. In 10 weeks we collected over 10,000 signatures and we stopped it. Do they make mistakes? Yes they do. Can we unite and make a difference and come up with a better solution? Yes we can. And I was so happy to see Trevor talking because he was the first of the politicians that mentioned alternatives. If we build another road, we're only postponing the inevitable. It's going to be one road after another road. I live on the Hedford Road. Traffic will still be coming in from Hedward and beyond. Traffic will still be coming on from Tune. We need green spaces. We need a living city. We need a public transport system, but the Irish don't use buses. So untrue. I went on a full bus this morning to Dublin. I came back on a full bus. People won't use bicycles. So untrue. Three years ago, there was a very small number of people on bicycles. And what has happened since? They've gradually started to make cycle lanes, and people are going on it. Together, we can make a difference. Do not let the system disconnect Castlegar from Sandyvale, from Menlo. If we will come up with a solution. We will not, if we have to wait another 10 years, we're only postponing a problem. So tonight, just don't sign the petition. We have to go out to the communities of Gowi, go to the schools, go to our own residence associations. We did it before, time and time again. We can do it again, and we can come up with a solution that isn't one of these six routes, nor is it the seventh. Look, follow the money trail. The so-called alternative, the route that people are talking about, the ball cotton and so on, who bought the lands there? There were property speculation going on. People were sitting, waiting for this to happen. They weren't investing in it. So follow the money trail and stand together as a community. And we are the ones that will make a better city. Thank you. Liam Ferry, Menlo. Um, I would like to endorse a lot of what Jerry said. I think it captured a lot of the, the difficulties that we're facing here. And they pointed out, as some others have done since, that the bypass may not be necessary. But what I really want to emphasize is that if you read what uh, Arab have to say about this, they ask the exact same question. They've got page uh, board five on the display here. They give you all sorts of options for public transport. They ask four questions, and the final word is, will the bypass still be necessary? And I think, from what I'm hearing from people who know Arab and who have worked with Arab, that they're a very responsible company. They don't uh, look for the bricks and mortar solution, and that if you work with Arab and give them some ammunition uh, to get the brief that they were given changed, that you can work it that way rather than trying uh, to denigrate people about what they're trying to do. Um, be, be positive about it and go for that. Don't put all your eggs in that basket, though. Go for something different. Finally, um, I was very perturbed to hear Hildegard come up with some very good solutions uh, or points say, that she'd like to have put into place about short-term <coughs> improvements in the city. I also heard Derek talking about the uh, democracy. I think there's a complete lack of democracy of what Hildegard tried to get through can be prevented by someone else who's not elected. 
uh, she, she wanted to find some short, short term solutions to get the traffic moving. Some of them I'd agree with. I think that tomorrow we should have free school buses for everybody, no matter how far they are from the school, and see what that does. It may not be the solution, but try it out, get it going right away, and keep going. And finally, uh, because uh, Derek was saying that uh, he's 36 years in the city, I better say I'm 41. <laughs> from the moment I came here, I said I'm not leaving. Okay, I, I suggest we take two more questions, if that's okay, maybe. Yes, go on. Um, my name is Thomas Welby, I'm a county councillor. Um, I'm not sure. Can I just say that the reason that you're all here tonight isn't a process that started about six months ago, it's, about, it's a process that started back in 1999. And that's the designation processes of the SSEs and the NHAs. And um, I'm a bit disappointed that Deputy O'Keefe isn't here tonight because he was very instrumental in, in bringing them in in 99 and now he's asking for them to be changed which, you know, to me was a little bit, uh, it's a little bit rich. But if you were, the reason the brief was given was to totally avoid all designations. And, you know, somebody, Derek said earlier on like, that it was great here, the power of the people. But you have to say, that's the power of the designations. Uh, that, that's what uh, the brief was given about. And, you know, when the designation started here in 1999, they normally said that about 7% of your landmass would be designated. Europe said it will give you Annex 1, which is a habitat, Annex 2 is a species. But like uh, Tom Kilgariff said earlier on, that we're, we're not correct, uh, we're lower in our, um, in our noise pollution. Um, but we're, we're top of the league in everything else. We're the best in, in HACCP, we're the best in health and safety. We even went along and we designated 15% of our land um, SSEs. And then on top of that, we designated our, we came up with our own designation, National Heritage Areas. And the, um, Marion mentioned it earlier on, it has, actually wasn't that the land was designated an SSC in the old route, it was designated an NHA, a National Heritage um, Area. And what I would say to the national politicians here is, if you want to start changing something, if we are going to have a, a, um, a bridge and a road going across, because in 2004 there was an average daily traffic of 27,000 cars at Glendale Abbey. You know, I've been coming in from Mutterard since 1977 by car. And we're talking about 16 years here and 16 years there of thinking and talking. And that's all we have been doing is thinking and talking. And we either have to either come up with a solution one way or the other in relation to it. But Connemara and areas like that, we want to try and live out there as well, and we can't. Because, I mean, there's the traffic, the business isn't coming into the region, and that's what it is, it's a region. So I think that if, the, if I have no problem going back to Galway County Council, if Galway County Council gave the brief not to go through an NHA and or an SEC and get them to change that, and I have no problem going back to them to ask them to extend the date as well. But at some stage we have to say to ourselves, what are we going to do? Are we going to be back here in 16 years' time again and saying, well, maybe we should go for something else? But we need a solution, and we need a solution fast because, you know, traffic is choking up the whole city. I can see loads of hands uh, popping up, right? I propose, if you like, we can stay on till about a quarter to ten if people would like to, to stay with this. Is that okay? Now, if you have a point to make, please, could you just be as concise as possible, because a lot of people obviously want to contribute. So I'm, I'm going to ask Frank, again, under that auspices, if you could be as concise as possible, please. Sorry, sorry, I'm a resident of Minlo. My family have been in Minlo since 1640, and I've been a councillor for the last four years. Um, I'm looking here at the emerging preferred route for the Galway City Autopub Bypass, public consultation, September 2000. And a lot of the information that's in it, this is quite a rare document, a lot of the information that's in it, and it was Ryan Hanley that proposed it, a lot of the information that in it, is in it is totally at variance with what are are now proposing. Now, we do have a traffic problem. We all whine about the traffic. We do have an issue. But I have a serious issue with where we're actually going to knock houses. 
This plan proposed to knock seven houses. Any of the routes now, the minimum houses are going to be knocked are 50. I don't agree with that. In the last week, right adjoining the, the, the pavement area in Minlow that went to the European Parliament, there was a HIMAC clearing land. Cleared and cutting, taken away where it had gone wild for the last 15, 20 years. He was allowed to go in there, I believe, to, to actually clear his land because he's no longer within the path of that bypass. There's a serious issue with the 250 people, landowners and homeowners, that have been left in limbo for the last 15 years with no compensation. Yeah. It's despicable that any state or Europe would treat anybody like that. It's unacceptable. And I'm asking any of you that are here tonight to actually come together and stand up and be counted and challenge in Europe compensation for your time and your money and your losses. It's unacceptable. Now, the, the, I have a proposal that, um, you know, something has to be done about the traffic. The Quincentennial Bridge can be widened to facilitate, like the Liffey Valley. You, Tom Kilgar, speaker here tonight, worked with Galway City Council. If you go out along the Western Dist Distributor Road, you'll see his name is still up on signage there, even though he hasn't worked for Galway City Council, I don't know how long, Tom, 10, 15 years. There was a, the Western uh, Distributor Road was designed two lanes each way. We built one lane each way. Put a bus corridor in there. Get the people moving on buses. 2,000 cars a day, uh, a peak, peak times per hour, go across the Prince Centennial Bridge. The issue is people in Knocknacarra working in Park Moor, and not one single bus goes across the Prince Centennial Bridge. It's an absolute joke. It's not an absolute joke. There's no joined up thinking. The, Quin the Prince Centennial Bridge was designed separate to the road coming down from the Flemings to the Minlow Park. They, they, they were joined up you know, through necessity. But we're never meant to actually link in together. Widen the Prince Centennial Bridge, put a bus lane both ways, allow people, change the city development plan so that people with two people or three people in the car can use the bus corridors to get to work. Carpooling, you know, you know there's solutions for a fraction of the cost. I'm on Galway City Council. Anytime that something comes up, all my other councillor colleagues will agree with me that there's never any money. Always the cheap solution. When, when they were building the, 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 um, the, the N6, the roundabouts, they put in the roundabouts, and I know this to be a fact, because they were the cheaper option. We've now turned around and taken them out to put in lights. The reason they put in lights was allow extra traffic to get through at peak times. It works out at 23% extra traffic to come through at peak times. But we are running out of time. Quincy Quincy <laughs> Bridge, as it stands, is at capacity. We are all in love with the car. We have to come up with solutions put in bus corridors, encourage people to use buses, and privatise it if necessary. There, there's a, a guy I spoke to during the week, he's got 10 buses. He's, uh, he's um, going up and down to the cliffs and water with tours, but he doesn't start till 10 half to in the morning. His bus could be used to transport people to work. That's issues. We have to look at choices. To, you know what I mean? If you look at, you can come in here and put a choice in, make it two way from uh, the um, west of here down to the Quincentennial Bridge. Bring the traffic across, circuitous route. We need money in City Council. We don't have that. And finally, I'll end on this point. In the last two months, we voted in Galway City Council to remove all reference to the N6 outer bypass. We will have to, in the next couple of months, and nobody has mentioned this, we will have to come back, and if they come along with a preferred route, we're going to have to put our hands up and say, yes, we agree with that. I will be asking every councillor to say, go away and find alternatives that will be, include mass transport of uh, people back and forth to work in the morning. Good morning. Okay, we'll, we'll have some contribution from residents now. Thank you. Hi, oh, yeah, Chair. Um, pardon? Sorry, just introduce yourself, please. I'm Shane Foran. I'm not a councillor. I've been a voluntary member of the Transport SBC of this city for about 10 years. I'm on the planning SBC as a voluntary member, elected by the community forum. This project was sold as a transport project for Galway and the environs. There was a consultation process. There were comprehensive submissions made on transport options for Galway as part of that consultation process. Then two weeks ago, we were in here. Was it in here? It was. And I came in, my interest is in walking and cycling in the city, active transport, that's what I try to promote. 
and they wanted to see what was happening for walking and cycling in this transport project. And they looked at the boards, and under walking and cycling, it said, Berna Greenway, Moycullen Greenway, Dublin Galway Greenway, Merlin Park Woods. Are we really expected to believe that the solution to get more people walking to work in Galway is a barn a greenway. The people are going to walk from Oar and Moor. The people are going to walk from my colour. And that's their solution for walking in the city. And they're going to spend 750 million on a road. It's mind boggling. It's absolutely bizarre. The man over there who spoke about the brief is correct. The engineers are professionals. They can only work to the brief that they are given but the instruction has to change, and it has to change fundamentally. And that's all I want to say. Okay, we're only going to allow uh, comments from residents now, so if you put your hand up, please be sure you're a resident. Okay, keep the mic down there, please. Thank you, thank you very much. I was beginning to wonder whether a bit of uh, gender bias going on there. I just really, I suppose, my only concern and what I want to say tonight, I'm, the experts have all been there and it's been a great evening and very enlightening. I do think that perhaps, I'm, I'm Mary Vegan, I live in Circular Road, I do live next to the school, I'm a GP, and I do feel that perhaps the health element tonight has been a very subliminal level altogether. To me, it's the most important aspect of all of this. We know always, going back for a long time, we have a lot of studies about where it's known, we'll say asthma, obstructive pulmonary disease, that it is detrimental to people to live near a motorway for these things. It's established, it's known. It's now also coming out that people with cardiovascular disease, established uh, vascular disease, coronary heart disease, that their situation is worsened by living near motorways. When you come to children, it's very much worse because of their physiology and their anatomy. Their metabolic rate is much quicker. They're, so again, it is known, and we're lucky, we have countries, they're looking at this in Holland, they're looking at it in New Zealand, in California. They've brought the law in in California that schools are not allowed to be within about 300 yards of a motorway. Their problem is that they're trying to rectify places that are there already by putting in filtration systems and that. But, as I said, asthma exacerb is an exacerbation in children who live or are at school near motorways. That's bad, it affects children with asthma already. The more recent evidence is more worrying, it's that children who live near motorways or are at school near motorways, that their actual lung development is impaired and that that is setting them up for lung disease later in life. Also, the other point I want to make is that during exercise, people, they take in about five times more air. So these particulates from the pollution go down lower into the lungs. Now, Dangan is the prom of this side of the city. Dangan, hockey pitch, Dangan ground. <laughs> and it is where people take their recreation, where people who haven't big gardens, who are in apartments, can walk their dog, walk their baby, older people go for it a saunter, whatever. Now, for the people who exercise there, it is a very healthy place in which to exercise. But now, all the pitches, everybody who exercises there with this pollution thing, they will actually possibly be harming themselves. And there's, there's evidence for all of this, there's well-documented medical articles. So, and I don't want to say that that's more or less it really on the health, but it's just that really it's far on Slaunch and on Severus. Our health is our most important aspect, and whatever route we go, all of these routes are going to bring motorways and pollution closer to homes, to families, and dangerously close to that particular school. And I just finished saying Hildegard knocked on there tonight, mentioned Bath. There's a lot of experts here tonight, light rail, all of these things. And if we do things, if we look at this adversity and see, look at what is the opportunity here, we could work hard at this and maybe wouldn't it be wonderful if in 10 or 20 years' time they're having meetings like this in Ireland and in Europe and that they'll talk about the Galway solution? 
where we didn't take the election. Thank you. Thanks. Um, my name is Colin Mahoka. Um, yesterday, my uh, family and I moved into a new house in Ardenlocka. Uh, that was two weeks after we discovered that three of the routes would be going through our kitchen. Um, I think somebody mentioned here that this whole process started off in 1999. Um, and I think we're still maybe trying to build a solution that might have been apt back then. If I were to tell you 10 years ago that you could put a little sat nav on your dashboard and it would tell you exactly what lane to go into, what turn to take to get to a certain uh, destination, you would probably think I was joking. If I were to tell you 10 years ago, or even five years ago, that you'll see electric cars, fully electric cars, on the road uh, today, and they will become very commonplace in a couple of years, you'd probably think I was loony. <coughs> these technologies are converging, and these sort of technologies, companies like Google are working on these smart systems, these smart cars, that will form electronic trains, they will utilize the road space so much more efficiently than the current cars. They will be able to maybe orders of magnitude in terms of the, the number of people, the number of cars that they can move uh, on, a on a certain roadway. So I think all these technologies are converging. I think if you, build, if, you, if you create an agency called the NRA, you charge them with building roads, you will get roads. And I think, you know, we talk about the region. I think the politicians, the vision here, we need to have a much bigger vision. People need to, you know, maybe, maybe we should take our 750 billion euros and maybe approach a company like Google and Mercedes and these sort of companies that are looking at these technologies. What could they do? You know, the Galway solution. Remember what they did in Galway. We could do it here as well. That's exactly what we want to hear in 10 years' time. That's what they did in Galway. They spent their money wisely. Thank you. My name is Pat Huffman, party governor from North Cleva. Now, I would have been one of the families that would be on the existing route that was knocked off the map at one stage, okay? Uh, you're talking here about the eight houses that have been taken out. Uh, my family, our whole family were in the, in the vicinity or in North Cleva for a couple of hundred years. And it was coming about 100 feet from our, our home house, maybe 30 feet down into the ground with the motorway. Now, we had to live with the the motorway coming and the anxiety of it at the start. I was here the last day at the meeting, I seen a lot of people's faces. I knew what they were coming from, because we were there already, you know? And the thing I'd like to say here tonight is that <coughs> maybe it houses in the lot and the farm lands that's where we're going to be taken out. But the green route and the and the blue route seems to be the ones that have been on the proposals. Personally, I don't want to any routes because we're part of the community out there and I look for other alternative solutions if it's possible. But I seriously don't want to see if thin roots doesn't come up or any other alternatives that they go back to the existing route that we were on and destroy our neighborhood. <laughs> I'd say to eight houses what's the lot when you talk about 120. So as I say to you, an alternative, whatever it is, but I don't want to see it come back in the old roads or anywhere in the locality. That's my point of it to say. Hi, my name is Kevin Gill, and I'm from Kappa, where uh, all roads converge. <coughs> There's no green or blue route or orange or pink or anything for us. They all come through Kappa. Every route was in within 500 meters of our house. The blue route will take our house. It took us, <coughs> excuse me, it took us five and a half years to get planning from this, from Galway City Council to build on family land on a disused building uh, <coughs> site. We're in the house three and a half years and we've been to meet her up twice. And so far they've told us that our house will be taken and our house won't be taken and again that our house would be taken, depending. You know, they don't know yet. They'll wait till they've decided what everyone wants to say 
and then they'll blindly ignore it and carry on under their remit from an executive that are not held accountable to us in any way. It's lovely that you all turned up, but you know, they get to decide. It wasn't until I had them backed into a corner that they approached me on how to get planning permission. I don't know what shenanigans went on, but it went on board Planola, and the report from Bob Pernola said that uh, we should get planning permission, but it got denied. These people are not held accountable for what they're doing. And we can talk, but unless we change how we govern things, it will just keep going on like this. The roads are not going to solve the problem because we're not using what we have already. Why are we building more when we don't use what we have? It's just a complete waste. Building roads is fine for cars, a technology that will be replaced. It's not going to be replaced in the next 10 or 20 years, but it will be replaced. And we will be left with these scars through our landscape that we have fought so hard to protect over the years, and it will be gone. The simple fact of it is, is that all routes go through CAFA. Our up don't know the difference between a blanket bog and a raised bog. The natural heritage area in CAFA is the blanket bog. The route that the road will take will actually destroy the drainage and it won't show up for 10 or 20 years, but that bog will die if the road goes through there. <coughs> so if you want to block it, it all goes through CAFA. That is one way. You just need hydrologists better qualified than I to prove that the stream, Barney Stream, which runs into the local amenity, actually proves where the drainage is and the road cannot go through there because their remit is not to destroy the environment. They don't care about destroying lives, they don't care about the stress they cause, but if their remit is to protect the environment, these routes are not going to do it. In fact, it's only after they pick the route that they will be doing an impact statement. And at that point, then people can start objecting. But they don't know what that impact statement's going to do yet. So it's just a sham that they're what they're at, up to, and uh, will continue to be so unless <coughs> we stop them. John Maloney said he'd just like to say a few words to him. We could just give him the mic next, please. Uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, there has been a lot of reverence here tonight uh, of the race course, and I just would like to tell you what will happen to the race course if any one of the four routes go ahead that come through the race course. The race course will be uh, dug up, as Brian Walsh alluded to, and uh, it will not be the developer or the engineer say that it will take nine months <coughs> to construct a tunnel through the race course. We feel that this is not possible, first of all, and that the race course would not be ready in time for the summer festival to be uh, run. So we would lose at least one, if not two, race meetings if there was any holdup in this. And it has been referred here tonight <coughs> that the bypass will cost 750 million. I think if the blue route goes ahead, you want to add another 120 million to that because that is what the races are worth to this city, 60 million a year. And if that is to happen, some organization that has been going on for over 150 years, I think it's a sad day for Galway. We, huge amount of tourists come into the city and I think the facilities at Galway Racecourse have been developed second to none and we're admired all over the world. So I think it would be a huge shame for something to happen to Galway races. I completely sympathize with any people here tonight that their houses are going to be taken. I'm talking about a race course, but I think it's much more serious when your house is at risk. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> okay, the lady is back in green. I think I want to say a few words. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Jerry Slavenboy Cullen. Um, I was actually at the public hearing that ARF gave in the City Hall there last week. There was absolutely loads of journalists there. Um, it was very interesting, very professional, but in my opinion, as a member of the public, they did not provide a sustainable answer to the problem that we have in this city, which Mr. O'Clarity and Catherine Connolly have referred to. 
up there on the platform. I, and I'm sure many other people in this room have lived abroad. I've lived in several cities abroad. I never owned a car until I came home here to Ireland. I travelled by boat, train, and when I lived in Holland, I cycled every single day of my life in and out to work. No problem, very safe. I don't cycle in Galway because, as Catherine Connolly said, it's too dangerous. The Galway City Council can't even get the colour of the cycle paths right. They go from red to black. Now, you either have a colour or you don't have a colour code, you know, if, you're, you're, if you want your children to be cycling, which I do, but I don't want them to be unsafe thinking they don't know where they're going and the drivers don't know where they're going. Um, so I think there are other models in other cities. I lived in a very small town in Holland, not a big city. I wasn't living in Amsterdam. I was living in a city the size of Galway. Nobody, nobody in the centre of that city drove. It wasn't a traffic-free city like, say, Bruges in Belgium. You could drive there, but the majority of people that lived there, worked there, and studied there cycled or walked if they lived right in the centre of the city. But there were people travelling in from the distance of, say, Barnet, Moycullen, and or more. And so I think, in my opinion, having listened to the public presentation by Arab, and you're talking about the type of money, the type of money that they're talking about for a bypass, which is going to resolve nothing, which is clear from this room, from everybody that has spoken, <coughs> is a pure, waste of money. And I actually spoke to Eileen, I can't remember her surname afterwards, and I asked her how much the survey had cost. But you know what she was more interested in talking about? How much it cost for all the um, the Bob Cotton reports and everything. That nearly came to the same amount of money. I wonder if people in the room know that. That fairly shocked me. So I think really, you know, like Trevor O'Clarity said and Catherine Conley said, we should be demanding a sustainable transportation for the city. If you have a proper transportation system, people will use it. Anybody in this room who has lived abroad has used, I am sure, public transport. And in London, somebody mentioned about kids going free. In London, children travel free on the underground school. They don't pay. They don't pay like I pay 300 euro a year to get my two kids into school. 300 euro, and I'm a widow. And I found that a disgusting amount of money to have to pay to get my kids into school. So, you know, there are things that we need to be thinking about as to what we should be spending our public and taxpayers' money on. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other inputs from the floor? That gentleman back in the left. <coughs> Hi, my name is um, Oliver Foley, and uh, I've listened with great interest in relation to the input by everybody, but I think anybody who's travelled, and, and certainly if you go to a city like Montpellier in the south of France, and it's a very historic city, if you look how they um, deal uh, with their light rail systems, their tunnels, and that was really as a result of an inspired um, politician who um, took it on board that he was going to make it the best city transport-wise in the south of France. It's well worth, we've plenty of elected politicians. You have opportunities to get on a plane, go down, have a look, take the best on board, and bring it back. I know myself, my preferred option is, in relation to the light rail option, certainly I like it, but I do believe that there is need for not a, a, a bypass, an underpass, whether you call it a tunnel or whatever. It does help the problems. All I'm saying is the solutions are there. It's not rocket science. We just have to go and look at them and apply them to this beautiful city. Thank you. Great. Um, I realize there's a lot of people leaving, perhaps are getting the ready to go. So maybe, would, you, would you like to say a few words at this point? So just to introduce Bray McGuinness, she actually was up on the east side of the country and got very short notice to come down this evening. So with respect, maybe before before you leave, you might uh, show give Bray some attention, please. Thank you. Um, I'm 
I don't blame you for leaving because it's been a long meeting, but thank you uh, if you can stay for two minutes. First of all, yes, I am new to this constituency. This is not a new issue. I gather it's been around for some time. Uh, I think the uh, presence in this hall this evening indicates the concern of many, many people, and I've heard some of those already. I'm actually here to listen, and I want to thank my colleagues here in the council, Councillor Frank Fahey and Councillor Frank Heaveney, and Deputy Sean Coyne, that kept me up to date with what's happening. Uh, so what I would propose, um, because the meeting uh, is obviously winding up, uh, if I could meet some of the committee members afterwards to be fully updated, uh, and just to offer you what support I can with my colleagues here, uh, the councillors and deputies, uh, because the fact that so many people, and, and I know there was standing room only because I followed you on Twitter as I came down from me, indicates the level of concern. Um, I don't think that people's houses should be bulldozed over, um, unless there is very good reason for that. I've heard some of the comments about other possible options around transportation generally in the city. I'm not an expert in that field, but I think people on the ground have got to be listened to. So, Chairman, I want to finish by saying that I'm here to listen and to learn and to offer my support uh, at a European level in whatever way I can to my colleagues to get the best possible solution for the people of Galway and for those who visit the city. I think that's what we all want. But clearly this meeting was called at short notice. Uh, I couldn't be here at the start of it because of a, a commitment in Mies. Uh, I'm here for the end of it and I'm here tonight, so I'm here to listen. Thank you. Okay, um, we're beginning to thin out, so I think this is a good time maybe to wrap up the meeting. Um, as I said, I'd like to thank all of the politicians that came here at, at short notice, as Mairead said. Um, it has been a very urgent process because I only learned about this process 10 days ago. So a lot of us worked really hard to mobilize this level of community awareness. And we are being told we have only another eight days in which to get our objections in. So that's the level of time pressure we've been put under to, uh, I guess, vote with our feet, vote with our hearts, vote with our minds and our bodies, or whatever it takes. And I know Frank Fahey spoke very heartily as well in terms of the experience in Menlo. No one in this room wants any of the six routes. That's very clear. They are they do not work for any of the communities. Galway has a fantastic tradition. I'm a Dubliner, by the way. I, told, I was told 13 years ago when I came down to work here that I was joining the Graveyard of Ambition. And the reason they said that is because Galway is such a beautiful city to live in. And you don't want to destroy that reputation. And having big motorways cutting through communities and bisecting communities is not progress. You'll be left with some offshoot of Dublin or something that no one will want to live here anymore. So, in closing, we said already we're looking for this process to be stopped. That is our prefer preferred position. We do not believe the routes will work. But what we're asking the community to do is between now and the February 27th is you must write in your letters, they call them observations, we like to call them objections. We've given you lots of cues in terms of how to construct your letters. Arab, as was stated earlier, are a professional company. They're doing a job to a certain brief. It's our job to, to communicate very clearly to them and in, the, in a lot of volume, for want of a better word, and get our points across. And hopefully we'll be successful in putting an end to this process. Thank you.